So good afternoon, everyone. Um, Oh. Um, welcome to this very private lecture today, um, which is about introduction to optical sectioning. Um, and I'm not Sven Teclar, so I'm his colleague Sebastian, who's worked together with um, Doug Richardson at the CBI. So today the lecture, as I told you, will be about optical sectioning techniques. And what I would like to give you is an overview about the different optical sectioning techniques, or at least I would say more than half of those optical section techniques in the open market um, and to point out advantages and drawbacks of the different techniques. First question that I would like to address is why do we actually need optical sections? And the basic answer to that question is because biological specimens are three-dimensional objects. And that means that if you take conventional images from three-dimensional objects, these conventional images, they are not only consisting or containing the in-focus structures that you want to see, but also out-of-focus structures that come from structures that are not in the focal plane, that lie above and below these structures. And um, that is something that you would like to get rid of, right? So we want to get an optical section image that has improved image quality, meaning a better signal to background, better signal to noise ratio, and ideally provides us with much more um, information about cellular structures, any kind of other structures that we're interested in. So we have to remove this out of focus light. However, where does this out of focus light come from? And one of the answers to that question I already um, answered is that this comes from light emission from non in focus tissue layers because we are imaging a three dimensional specimen. However, another answer to that question is that um, out of focus light comes due to the point spread function of a microscope system. When you consider a fluorescent point source, so the most basic element that you can image, whether it's inside the structure or whether it's just the micro, um, this fluorescent point source looks in an ideal world like that, just like a point, right? It's quite easy. However, in exact, however, when light from the fluorescent point source travels to a compound microscope, this fluorescent point source in your image will not look like the real object, but will rather look like a complex three-dimensional fraction pattern of this one. Because the fraction pattern is different in x, y, and in x, and in x, and x, the resolution is worse compared to x, y due to the shape of the lenses inside my microscope. So you can describe this complex three-dimensional pattern by a certain function of its intensity. And this function is called the so-called point spread function of a microscope system. It can be described by different kinds of formulas with respect to lateral dimension or with respect to axial dimension. So keep this information that is provided to you in mind for some of the upcoming slides. Now I would like to give you an overview about the optical sectioning family microscopy. You see a long list of different optical section techniques that you can apply, and most of them also available in, the, uh, in our CBI. You can cluster this optical section in the family um, if you consider different applications. You have flexible systems, deep imaging systems, fast imaging systems, and super resolution systems. Maybe some of you are not really agreeing with this kind of classification. I actually put up another kind of classification, how you can cluster these different techniques, and this is not this slide. If you consider the optical section methods that are out in uh, the microscopy world, you can generate different kind of sub-branches with respect to um, their, their technique, their hardware specifications. And basically we have three different sub-branches in optical section, which is the downstream strategy, where you remove all the focus light that you have acquired that's inside your image. Then we have the detection strategy um, branch, where you block out the focus light that is still generated but not recorded. And then we have the excitation strategy, where we avoid all the focus light, um, so we are not generating any kind of out of focus light that then also doesn't need to be blocked by any hardware. What I would now like to do is I would like to go through these different methods and within, I don't know, five to ten minutes per, per section, 
explain what the advantages of this different techniques are. So let's, start, let's just start with deconvolution, one of the most basic techniques of the section. When light from our fluorescent point source, for instance from a microsphere, travels to the optical systems, I told you on one of the previous slides, it is not, uh, it is not um, displayed as a point, but as a point spread function of that point with okay. a certain intensity proper distribution. And this whole process that the imaging system goes through is called convolution. A certain object is convolved by the system, and this object is then represented by its point spread function. Right? So just this process from an object to an image in a microscope system is called convolution with a certain point spread function. And what deconvolution actually is, is that we try to use a software, take our image that contains this um, point spread function, and try to calculate back how the real object looks like. So we try to reassign um, the photons. And how do we do that? Basically, all you need is a z-step, the point spread function of the respective wavelength, a computer, and the respective software. So you acquire a 3D wide field data set, so just a z-step on a wide field camera-based system. Um, you compute, um, 3D, compute this 3D um, data set, and then deconvolve it with an algorithm that knows the theoretical or by you measured point spread function, and by that, the system can get rid of all the focus lights of, of light that doesn't belong to the focal plane that you're interested in. So this image looks much more uh, crisp, carefully, um, white field. What are the advantages of that technique? Um, from all um, optical sectioning techniques, it's the highest light efficient and most sensitive technique because every photon that you collect is actually heat. You're not throwing away any kind of photons by blocking. Um, these photons. Um, it provides you with the lowest phototoxicity and photo features of the sample. Because as you use all of these photons, you can use a very low exposure time, right? um, or a very low laser or light source. Mm -hmm. It's resource efficient because you just do high speed image acquisition and do the computation offline on the offline workstation computer. So you don't have to spend so much money um, sitting in front of the or so much time sitting in front of the computer. You can just let the convolution run but do something else. For simple with respect to the hardware configuration, you can use all different kinds of light sources, um, and you can, can combine it with other section methods, for instance, the control microscopy. So you can also use a control microscope system, acquire these things, and then later on apply um, a deconvolution algorithm. However, one of the drawbacks with respect to deconvolution, you always need to acquire a 3D image set, so you can't really calculate um, the real object from a single plane. The offline computation is relatively time consuming, so when you're in need of, of getting information relatively quick, um, this is a real drawback. Depending on your structures that you want to use, depending on your Z step that you require, but the conversion is sometimes difficult to handle. You can, of course, use some default algorithms that are provided by our software or that are provided by image or any other image processing software. But that might produce some incidents as artifacts and can increase noise. So, therefore, what you can do is you can not choose to use the theoretical point spread function that the system knows that is measured in the factory, but you can also use a bead, for instance, a multi fluorescent bead embedded in the event media that you also use for your sample because it has an impact on how the light is diffracted. Measure the PSF. And our software has a small wizard. Uh, which you can do that very easily. And then apply this measured point spread function on your image to get from the original image to a deconvolved image without the artifact. However, another drawback is that it's a camera-based system, so it's limited with respect to spectral flexibility, and it's not practical for a big, highly scattered sample. Next point, structured illumination. Structured illumination it can be found on our iPhotope system or on our Elira SIM system. And how does it work? It basically works in the way that you project a grid pattern into the focal plane of the objective. Now, 
and the software then automatically calculates an optical section online from at least three images that you acquired from one focal plane. Relatively easy to use, and it blocks out of focus light or kind of removes out of focus light relatively um, efficient. So, as I told you, a grid is projected into the focal plane, which is then visible in the eyepiece of the camera. You find at least um, three images where the grid is positioned as a different um, coordinate, right? And depending on what kind of system you use, you have to create 15 cases in the aperture structure elimination system, or 15 or 25 cases in the, um, in the virus sim system. Um, then you use a relatively simple equation um, to calculate the pixel intensity for your focal plane. And basically it's the square root of the sum of the intensity differences between the different images. That's all the structure combination for, so there's no more magic um, behind that. And the result of this equation is if the local change in contrast is higher, meaning that the value that's um, coming out from this equation is a relatively high value, then the structure lies within the focal plane and the intensity value right, that you see will become brighter um, in the optical section image, so the computed image compared to the uh, conventional image that you've acquired before. And if the local change in contrast is zero, so if the number below the um, you know the square root gets close to zero, then the fixed intensity value will become um, uh, the fixed intensity, um, say intensity, will get closer to that. Right? So that will increase the contrast in the structure dimension. That helps you to detect the structure interest in much better way. However, what's also nice about structure dimension is that you can combine structure dimension with deconvolution. So what you can do is you can acquire a conventional epifluorescent image that looks like that. Then, and I just showed as an example the upper tone, but you also got in the iris system. You do optical sectioning and we really see that due to the optical sectioning and due to the removal of autofocus type, the image becomes more crisp. And then when you do a Z stack and apply the convolution, you see that the image gets even more crisp. Right, so these techniques enable you to um, get a much, um, a much more crisp image. So advantages are you only need to have truly optical section. It's easy to use, so there's no more magic, no more magic about it. It's relatively fast on that calculation of optical sections. And if you also use a camera-based system, it's uh, very low with respect to uh, the photosensitivity of the image. Are that the system is relatively slow because you need to acquire multiple images per section. So about two frames per second is a realistic maximum that you can achieve with respect to the speed, meaning that you can't cannot really observe um, fast processes. So structural combination is rather considered to be a good tool when structure are fixed and nothing to use. Um, the penetration depth is limited by the grid contrast. So what we actually say in our system is that you shouldn't use any kind of samples that are taken at 50 micrometers. Um, and another drawback could be that you might get some artifacts due to movement, right? If you have any vibrations in the room, you're not working on vibration of your table, if you touch the system, the grid lines, they kind of vibrate and then the whole algorithm is going to work properly. Okay, let's move to the center branch of our optical section family. Um, the detection strategy. So we still generate all the focus light, but we we'll block the detection of the focus light by either a focal point scanning system or by a spinning system. How the confocal point scanning system works? As many of you know, at least half of you are going to tell you, but you think repetition that is never bad. Um, if you use, so confocal um, laser scanning microscopy works in the way that you have a laser that projects. It's, um, it's laser line onto a main dichroic beam splitter. And this main dichroic beam splitter has a property of so called a notch filter, which is usually transmissive for many, many wavelengths, but not for certain wavelengths and will reflect these certain wavelengths. In this case, it's an MBS main beam splitter exclusively reflected for 48 
phase of energy, which reflects the 488 laser light, meaning that 488 laser light will fall um, onto your sample and will kind of converge into the focal plane of your object. The fluorescent light that is coming back from the sample goes also through the objective, passes through the mirror because the mirror is transmissive of any other wavelength, and then it's full multiplier that acts as a detector in support of constants. However, with the laser light, you're not illuminating only your structures in the focal plane, but also structures that lie above your focal plane, above the structures you're interested in, and also structures that are below your focal plane. So the question that we now have to answer is, how do we get rid of the light that is not in the focal plane? So how do we um, only um, retrieve light from the focal plane? And the answer that um, you're probably most familiar with is that we put minute diaphragm into the light arm um, and put it into a confocal or into the conjugate plane of the focal plane. So in a plane where the light rays that come from focal plane of the objective converge. Right? And light from layers that are above or below the focal plane, they do not converge in this plane. So they will be physically blocked by the spin loss rotation. That is how we can block the autofocus that, that we generate also in our sample. Right. However, this rejection depends on the opening size of the pinhole. And the pinhole diameter never determines how much signal also from our uh, focal plane reaches the detector. And what we recommend you and what you usually see in the software is that you set your image acquisition settings for every different channel to one area. So you kind of change this opening depending on the wavelength and also uh, be fair on the numerical aperture of your objective. And what does this one area unit button actually do? Um, as I told you, it closes or sets the pinhole according to the wavelength and the numerical position of the, um, the objective. But when you consider the light that comes from your structures, the light in the focal plane, it is blocking parts of the light from your structures of interest. But, of course, also structures, uh, also light that comes from structures that are out of your um, out of your focal plane, at the top of the lower. That's the main purpose of it. But in order to achieve that, in order to block light that you don't want there, you have to live with a compromise that you also block some light from your structures that you actually want to see. However, as I told you in one of my previous lectures, I cross is all about finding the right compromise. And this one area unit button or this one area unit setting is one of the best compromises that we can provide you with and therefore we can implement this button in the software. So if you click on that button, the pinhole will be reduced or will be set to a parameter where you only image the center P of the point spread function, meaning that you are left with about 70 to 80 percent of the light intensity from your structure. What you can theoretically do is you can close the pinhole even further and by that increase the resolution. However, if you do that, you massively lose light from your signal. And therefore, you would either need to have a very bright fluid form or a very photostable fluid form where you can use very high laser intensity. And this is something that I would say 95% of people that work on the control microscope unfortunately do not have. Therefore, this one, every unit, resembles the best compromise. Okay, what are the advantages? <coughs> the advantages on the confocal point scanning microscope are, of course, because you use a photon which you tube, is that you can simultaneously or sequentially image samples with multiple fluid forms, something especially with respect to simultaneous imaging, which is not easily possible on a camera-based white field system. Um, you can vary the optical section thickness, as I told you, by changing, opening, or closing the table. Um, the section um, your samples are optics. You don't have to wait for a long period of time to affect to any kind of computational process afterwards or during the manipulation. You can do some pixel precise photo manipulation <coughs> with a flip, photo activation, photo conversion for live cell imaging, which is also not, um, let's say, not easily possible on a wide field system. 
and you have relatively good depth penetration, which is useful for all kinds of tissues that you use. Therefore, the system is also a system that most of you guys actually work with in our laboratories, and quite the majority of the systems we have in our facility um, are um, confocal microscopes. The drawbacks in confocal point scan microscopies are, it's, um, are that it's relatively slow because we are scanning point by point in the wide field system to get the information from all points in one shot. And here we have um, point by point acquisition. Another disadvantage is that you usually use very high laser power, so you have a high um, light intensity per pixel, meaning that you can bleach or damage your sample. Um, and you have a problem that if you image weak fluorescence, um, this might be relatively difficult because you also block much of this weak fluorescence by the people. Um, and because the POTs that you're using as a detector in the control system are generally less sensitive than the camera-based system, so CCD or EM CCD system, which kind of compounds the problem that I mentioned. Now let's move over to the spinning disk system, another strategy where we block all the focus line. And as an example, I chose the spinning system, uh, spinning disk system that we offer on all systems, um, which has a Yukogawa disk um, inside, or it's actually attached to the system, which works in a way that you scan 1,000 confocal points um, more or less simultaneously in a parallel fashion. And it works in a way that we have two disks that rotate synchronously. We have excitation lights so with some laser light that goes through a micro lens array. Um, where laser light is focused onto the pinhole array. The light from the pinhole array then exits by the objective onto my specimen from there back to the beam splitter and uh, falls onto the camera. So the advantage of spinning this microscope system is that you achieve very high frame rates because of this parallel scan of more than 1,000 points. So this system is much faster than confocal laser scanning microscope system. So in case you really want to go for speed, if speed is your main objective and you still want to have a confocal system, then you should definitely go for spinning this system and should um, rather avoid confocal laser scanning microscope system. But also, of course, depends on what kind of systems I actually want. Um, another advantage is because um, you can use low, lower excitation powers compared to a um, compared, to a confoc uh, compared to a conventional confocal laser scanning system. So you will have less bleach and lower phototoxicity um, in general, which now with the, with the new Airy scan system, the fast system, is close to be uh, kind of um, challenged. Um, and you can use um, detectors, as I told you already in the previous slide, that have a quantum efficiency of up to 90%, whereas a conventional laser scanning microscope systems with PMTs. Um, reach hardly 50%. So if you want to image dim samples and you want to image them very fast, the spinning the system is a system which you actually go. What are drawbacks? Um, one of the main drawbacks is that the pinhole inside this disk is fixed. You can't change this pinhole. Meaning um, that if you use low magnification objectives, your images will result in um, suboptimal optical sections. So you will not achieve the highest um, section and quality that you might get. Um, you will have a low signal to background in thick samples, and um, due to that, you might get some stripes or mark patterns inside the pictures. Okay, now let's move to the branch excitation strategy in our optical section family. I would like to start with our light sheet system. So the light sheet system has one of the um, one of the great advantages that you can um, that it's built around the sample that you can go and take the specimen cylinder or the specimen um, syringe and pick any kind of view um, that you want to use for imaging. So that's an advantage for all of us. So in case you need to rotate your sample, the light sheet system is a system that you should go. So we produce the light sheet system and of the tissue, which is nowadays mostly used for offer actual sample of what the light sheet was actually originally developed. We can apply certain physiological conditions, aqueous medium, um, and certain temperatures or certain CO2 concentrations. 
So the illumination light path in the light shield microscope, microscope system is a bit different compared to the other systems in the way that the illumination light path is kind of horizontal or horizontally built inside the system. But the laser beam is shaped into a light sheet, and all it looks like I will present you in one of the upcoming slides, um, using cylindrical lenses that sit inside um, behind these objectives. It works in a way that scanning mirrors <coughs> with this sheet, this blue sheet that is depicted in this image, and along the Y um, axis in order to scan over your sample. <coughs> And the unique feature of the light shield system is that the detection objective sits perpendicular to the illumination. So it is decoupled from the illumination view. What is the difference compared to the IP illumination um, to the light shield illumination? The IP illumination, you illuminate and you detect um, two folds that are um, along the optical axis of the detection objective. So the, um, so the Fluophores where you detect light from are all the fluophores that lie within the object, lie along the optical axis of your of your objective. When you do light shield illumination, you generate a very thin layer of light um, and only illuminate a couple of fluophores, and you are only detecting those fluophores that are falling or that are lying along the optical axis of the detection objective. So you're not detecting any kind of rule force that are not within the focal plane of the objective. So therefore, you're not generating of the focus light. Right? So the advantage of the light sheet system are that only all the focus corrects into the forehead. Um, and by that, um, you need, also you need to use a lower um, laser power. So you minimize reach and you use photo damage compared to conventional um, laser scanning microscopes. Now that advantage, as I showed you, can handle large living or clear 3D specimen without squishing them or breaking any of the sections. Um, and it usually has a sufficient spatial temporal resolution for observing tiny 3D processes also a good feature compared to conventional uh, laser scanning microscopes. So a couple of slides where you can do the sample, you can do three dimensional of your organism, you can penetrate very, very deep into, for instance, an embryo, you can observe them for a very long time period, you can select a field of view to limit the amount of data that you're collecting, and as I told you, you can also use it to Imaging, and in this case, you can image the heartbeat of um, a zebra fish. Some drawbacks are that um, only certain sample sizes are possible. So if you want to image the brain of an adult mouse, it is not really possible unless you apply some, some fancy um, chemistry and kind of shrink the tissue. That's kind of a new technique that um, kind of recently was published from a researcher in Germany called you will discord, I'm not uh, mistaken. We can kind of shrink tissue and then fit it into the light sheet system to still kind of observe um, features from larger, um, from larger organs. However, another disadvantage is that you need quite a long time for sample preparation. Every one of you who has worked on the light sheet system actually knows that this is one of the most tedious parts in the beginning to prepare your sample and put it into the light sheet uh, microscope. Imaging is relatively easy compared to the um, sample. Okay, next um, optical sectioning techniques, technique in this third branch is multi-photon excitation. Multi-photon or two-photon excitation, we explain in a short while. First, I would like to um, point out how single photon excitation works. In single photon excitation, your fluid force is excited after the absorption <coughs> of a single photon that is usually in the visible um, range, for instance, 48. So an electron from the fluid form who gets excited to an excited state, then relaxes, releases some heat during the process called vibrational relaxation, and then jumps back or falls back from the excited state to the ground state where a photon is emitted. That is the fluorescent signal that you take. In um, multi-photon excitation, your fluid form or the electron from the fluid form gets excited after simultaneous absorption of two photons that are, like, that are in the infrared range. 
And the same process occurs by pressurization and release of food or fluorescent, um, fluorescent signal. So, um, classification, so multifold excitation requires the flow for to simultaneously absorb two or more photons in the infrared range. And this process, and that is actually the important take home message for multifold excitation, only occurs in a region of high photon density. And this is usually the point, it should be the focal volume of the objective density. And this is reflected by the image that you see on the right. The objective that is located on the right um, and the corresponding illumination pattern that you see in this grid um, represents a single photon excitation. So you excite with a single photon, and what you see is that you have the highest density of excitation in the center of your illumination pattern. That is the focal point of the objective. However, what you also see here is that you excite through a force that are above and below your focal. So this is the autofocus light that is then blocked by the pinhole in the control of the um, laser scanning microscope. In a two-photo microscope system, which is presented by the lower part, the lower left part of the image, only the center part of your cuvette um, shows some fluorescence. Because only this is the, only that region will receive a simultaneous um, excitation of um, the two photons that you use. Um, from the two so you see that there's no fluorescence generated in the layers above and below um, the, the focal plane of your objective, meaning that no confocal pinhole is required. Another question that I would like to answer is why infrared light is usually used for fluor for excitation in multifocal systems? And the reason for that is that we're using that long wavelength light here is correct, um, penetrates much deeper into the tissue because the vibration frequency of infrared light or high um, wavelength light is lower compared to short wavelength light. So the probability that this, these light photons hit any kind of structures and get diffracted or scattered is lower. That's the reason why we're using long wavelength light because we also want to use that light to penetrate relatively deep into our tissues. That's the main reason why people use the quarter microscope system. So the advantages of the system is, as I told you, you can use it to do some heat imaging. Infrared light um, causes less toxicity to living cells or organisms, so you can image for a longer time period if you have any critical process that you want to observe. Um, infrared light um, excitation is maybe better than visual, uh, visual light um, excitation. You limit bleaching to the focal plane, so to no other plane. You can still have, um, you can still apply different point scanning techniques through some photo manipulation, for instance, uncaging of calcium in deeper layers to induce any kind of activity, neural activity in the brain for animals. And as it's a pulse laser, it's also ideal to uncouple it to any kind of lifetime imaging device. Drawings in a multi-photon system is that it's not really useful for thin samples. I don't know whether some of you tried that out already, but it happened to me yeah, quite often in the beginning. The infrared wavelength of the power of the laser is, can sometimes be very strong, so it can really boil and destroy the sample. So you really create a hole in the sample, basically. Um, another disadvantage is that many fluor force are still uncharacterized for photon excitation. Because it's not like that, that you have a nice um, excitation spectrum for every kind of dye, and that this excitation spectrum is similar between the different fluid force, it's still kind of some kind of, um, I don't want to call it weird, but um, um, it's, yeah, yeah, you can call it weird, it's kind of still some, some mystery about how the fluid force is actually excited by the different, uh, by the two photons. And therefore, what I would recommend is always check the literature um, to see what kind of laser power, what kind of wavelength or two photon system you should actually use to excite the fluid force. Right, another main disadvantage is, um, and that's also why many uh, two photon systems exist, is that the infrared laser um, are usually the most expensive part of the system and therefore um, blow up the expenses for a microphone. The last topic that I would like to talk about is total electronic reflection. 
For torsion transdeflection, you need to have some samples in water filled dishes. Basically, you need to have a dish that provides you with a glass water interface. Because when you have a glass water interface, you can uh, make use of a phenomenon that is called total internal reflection when you project the laser light, the incident laser light, at a certain critical angle inside the objective and hit the glass water interface um, with an angle that is usually above 61 degrees. Because if you do that, then this light is reflected totally back into the glass and does not penetrate into the water. And what is the advantage of that? when we don't have any laser light in our sample, but the total reflection of our laser light. The reflection is total in the sense that there's no lasting flow of energy across the boundary. So that's what I showed you before. So all the laser light is projected back into the objective. However, the electromagnetic field that is generated at the interface border does not disappear. So you have some energy field that builds up at this glass water interface. And this field that is generated is called the evanescent field. And the size or the strength of the evanescent field, so the penetration depth, is usually in the order of a uh, fraction of the used rate. So it's usually below 200 nanometers. So within this range, so within 200 nanometers, a very small fraction of size actually, this is the area where you can excite fluid force not anywhere else. So you will probably only use that to illuminate any kind of fluorescent proteins that you're interested in that are associated to the membrane. Because the evanescent field will not be strong enough to illuminate fluid voice that are inside the cytosol of your cell. So because the evanescent field kind of stops right after the, uh, the cellular membrane, um, we are not exciting any fluid force that is located there. So you just have a black background. So you generate a very high zero dimension. And with respect to speed, if you want to image dynamic processes, you're basically only limited by the camera reading because the build out of the evanescent field occurs every, um, um, at, a, at a rate of a couple of kilohertz, which is usually much faster compared to any kind of camera reader. So it's a very, very fast system to see it um, and obtain images from past cellular processes that occur along the membrane. The drawback, um, or the main drawback of a turf system, that's probably also the reason why we don't have a turf system in our corner, a purely turf, a pure turf system is that it's actually limited to samples and a glass water interface. It also cannot do any kind of z step because the renaissance field is not really penetrating into the tissue. So it is actually it limits you with respect to the experimental potential that the system should, should provide you. It's a camera-based system, which of course is fast, but it's limited with respect to spectral um, flexibility. And as you need to use objectives with a high virtual aperture, the field of view is usually very small. Okay, let me give you a short summary. Um, today we talked about a big family of optical sectioning methods that can be subdivided in three branches. Downstream strategy, oops, okay. downstream strategy branch, where you acquire images with autofocus line, and where you get rid of the autofocus line by computation, either by deconvolution or by structural illumination. Then we talked about the detection strategy branch, where we still um, excite through reports that are not in the focal plane of our sample, but block this autofocus light um, by pinhole, that is either a focal point scanning system or a spinning system. And last but not least, we talked about the excitation strategy branch, but we avoided, we have methods that avoid the generation of autofocus light, like light sheet, multifocal system, or total internal reflection. And depending on what kind of application we could do or what kind of application, um, to try to um, try to use, um, you have to check out. Um, now we really uh, Now you have to kind of check out the best compromise or find the best compromise with respect to different parameters that you prioritize for your application. And then you can kind of find out what kind of system is the best system for you. And then I would like to finish. Oh, no, I don't want to do it yet. 
So if you want to read more about optical sectioning, just visit, visit our Zeiss um, online campus page where there's a big description, um, a long description about different kind of optical sectioning techniques where there's nice animations how the different optical sectioning techniques actually work. And now I would like to finish and thank you for your time. Any questions from your side? Yes. Uh, you said you mentioned that light sheet, the, the size of the sample is kind of limited for the limits uh, of the size. No, it's the chamber. chamber. Mm -hmm. yeah, in, which the, in which the sample is located. So, so yeah, the chamber is not easy to get. One by one by two centimeters. Okay. Okay. Right, so if there are no further questions, you're always free to, to come up to the CBI and ask Dr. Neil and any, any questions you have for the next step. Okay, so thanks again for your attention and have a wonderful day. Thank you.